3, Matthew chapter number 3. We're going through the life of Jesus. It's a biography of him. So we have looked through his his birth, we have looked through his childhood. Now we're getting to the start of his ministry. Matthew chapter number 3, we'll, we'll read through the entire chapter of chapter number 3, being it's only 17 verses. Verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 3 says, In those days were, came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Sounds delicious, right? Then went out to him Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance." And think not to say within yourselves, we are Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lightning upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our message today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your word, Father. We ask you to use it in our, in our lives today. Father, may you, if our hearts are not right with you, may you rebuke us. May our hearts be softened. May our eyes gaze upon you and your glory. And help us to have a will to say yes to you versus the will to do our, our own thing. Father, we ask you to help us be more conformed to the image of Christ. And may you help us to love you most in this world. I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The subject of baptism it's a very interesting subject. Uh, each church, uh, each denomination of churches has their own thoughts about baptism. Who is supposed to be baptized? When are they supposed to be baptized? How are they supposed to be baptized? All these different questions, a lot of denominations do different things. For instance, some... Take a baby and put the baptismal water on the baby and it was sprinkled. Some of you might have been sprinkled as a baby. I was not. Um, one, my sibling was, so my brother, he, he was sprinkled as a baby, but I was not. I thought I got gypped. 
<laughs> I thought I got you. Man, why didn't I get that? Man, uh, you know, he must be more, more uh, sanctified than I am. So, uh <laughs> But no, as I grew up, I realized, well, that wasn't really anything. In fact, you know that our, well, we don't really have a denomination. We're Baptist. Amen. Uh, we're independent Baptist. That means we have no affiliation with any other uh, conference, no other um, denomination. We are our, ourselves. There is no, there is no uh, high office except for, well, a pastor to God and before you. Okay, that's it. You know, we don't, we don't you know, call the president of our denomination and say, hey, we got a water leak. No, I have to figure that out. So, <laughs> by the way, we don't have a water leak just in case you were wondering. So, for interesting, for Baptists, we are actually in the minority. Think about all the denominations that do infant baptism. There's a lot of them. And there's a reason why. The reason why there are more denominations that baptize infants is because every single one of them have come out of Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism started the infant baptism as a way to include the infant into the church and therefore be saved. That's the history of infant baptism. And from that point on, you have denominations coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, Lutherans and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and all these different other Asians that, uh, that you say all these different ones, but they practice infant baptism because they had a lot of baggage from Roman Catholicism. Now, if you take the Bible and just let the Bible speak for itself, it's interesting. Most people that do that, they become Baptists. <laughs> now, I was not a Baptist. I was not raised Baptist. Um, I was raised as non-denominational uh, affiliation. That means, uh, what one Christian comedian says, is that it makes you a Baptist church with a cool website. It's non-denomination. <laughs> By understanding uh, that I did not know anything about doctrine when I was growing up. Not much. I knew that Jesus died for me. I know He rose from the dead. Other than that, well, this thing of baptism. I thought when I was growing up that if you got baptized, that means you got saved. It's called baptismal regeneration. That if you dunk yourself under the water, you come up, ta-da, you're saved. Well, I thought that, and I, then I went to John chapter 3 to say, well, this must be what it's talking about. He that is uh, of water and of the Spirit, it will be saved. Oh my, water? Well, that's baptism. Well, no. I learned to, later to take things into context, right? <laughs> And so when I went to uh, the specific college that I went to, I didn't know exactly what I was in for, and then I realized that it was a Baptist college. I thought, oh, those Baptists. Because I thought that Baptist was a cult. Okay? <laughs> I grew up and I was taught that the Baptist denomination, that is like a cult. And they're wrong. Okay. So I went to a Baptist college thinking to myself, well, I gotta, I gotta keep right and true to, to, to the Bible, okay? And then somebody challenged me. I started talking with them. They challenged me. Really? Because I didn't believe once saved, always saved. And they said, "Well, you should look into that." And I couldn't defend myself. Why? Well, I went to uh, Ezekiel for that. I went to other places that kind of showed that you can lose your salvation. But then when I did my research over summer break. I learned, I'm like, wow, I guess once you're saved, you're always saved. And then I'm like, maybe I'm wrong about baptism. So I did some studying. And so I have learned quite a bit about baptism. And so I understand that if you are baptized, it doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. Now, in order to be baptized officially by our church, you have to have a testimony that yes, you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. And so, with that, we then baptize you. And so, we talk about baptism. And I had the question. I had the question this week. Where did baptism come from? What was the origin of baptism? And as I studied that out, 
it became more apparent that it's not a new thing when John the Baptist all of a sudden comes on the scene and starts baptizing people. Actually, it's been going on for a long period of time. Since the time of the law that came forth. So it's very interesting that, it, that baptism is actually has Jewish roots to it. See, what they have is called a mikvah. A mikvah is kind of a pool that has some running water going into it. And what a person would do is what they would go in and there would be somebody to officiate this thing of, of immersion. And they would then dunk. And, be, and they have to be totally immersed. It's very interesting. And there's loads of reasons for this. I'm going to give you some. Which, may, which kind of connects with the different baptisms that we see throughout the New Testament. The first thing that it, it signifies in the Old Testament is if you have this immersion, is that, well, you were unclean, now you've come to be cleansed. Okay, well that's interesting. Like for instance, if you touched a dead body, that makes you unclean until even, and then you wash and then you're clean. Okay, well that's interesting. And then other reasons why you would be unclean, that is a way to signify the fact that you are cleansed. Another way of, of looking at it is that of, uh, hold on, let me associate my notes here. I'm a studious guy. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so the next one is from it signifies death to life. For instance, when the, uh, the people of Israel were going across the Jordan into the land, the promised land, they went through the Jordan River, and what the Jewish people associate that with is on one hand you were in like death, and then you crossed over the water into life. Think about that. Okay, the next way after that is is specifically that you are uh, signifying that somebody or something is sanctified for the use in temple services. So if you have a thing that, you, that is going to be used in the temple, you, well, immerse it in these waters. They will come out, now it's ready for use. Then the last way that it was used was for proselytes, or those who are discipled under a certain teacher. What would happen is that they would be so under the authority of the teacher that they would be then immersed in the name of that teacher. Okay, now I have lost every single person here. Uh, <laughs> this is why it's significant, okay? The very different um, ways of baptism in the New Testament all signify to each and every one of those particular ways. For instance... The first type of baptism that we see in the New Testament is that of John's baptism. John's baptism, as we see in Matthew chapter 3, notice with me, verse number 2, Matthew chapter 3, verse number 2, and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice with me in verse number 5 what happens. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan. Notice this. Confessing his sins. The ultimate way of being unclean, yes, in the law, according to the law, there's specific ways that you become unclean by touching things, by some things happening, some um, various different things happening. Well, we'll just leave it at that. And you become unclean. But then... What John's saying, repent. The ultimate way of being unclean is sin. Sin makes a person unclean. And so the, the fact of the matter is he says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying that the Messiah is coming. The kingdom is coming. You need to get right with your heart. And you need to confess your sins. And then he, after a person is repentant, they go forth to John, confess their sins, and then he immerses them in water. Very significant to the first way of that, of making a, a unclean thing clean once again. But then we see that of the baptism regeneration, kind of in a way. Romans chapter 6, I'm going to turn there now. 
Romans chapter number 6 is another way of baptism, as I see in the Scriptures. Romans chapter number 6. And we see in verse number 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Here is a baptism. I once referred to it as baptism of the Holy Spirit. I disagree with my own thought about that right now. Because what this is, is a different way of, okay, you get saved. What you do is you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ What happens immediately at that moment in time that you have gone from death to life. You are buried with Him in baptism in His death and now you are raised to walk in the newness of life. That's just like how the Jewish mindset was about baptism from death to life. The third way. The third way that we see in the Bible is that of the baptism of the Holy Spirit which some of you might say, Okay, he's gone Pentecostal now. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible describes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not doing it. The Bible does. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Just stay with me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be good. That's verse number 13. For by one Spirit... Are we all baptized, notice this, into one body? Whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, and have made made all been made all to drink into one spirit. Think about this. We are now baptized by the Holy Spirit. What that testifies about is the my my talking is it's kind of I get really excited and then I kind of go crazy here. Okay, so what happens with this baptism is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the filling of the Holy Spirit. They're two different things. Uh, D.L. Moody put them together. You've got to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, according to what the Bible says, baptism of the Holy Spirit happens immediately when you get saved. What it is is when you get saved, you now are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church. So you're sanctified for the Master's use. You're in the church. You have the spiritual uh, talents that the Holy Spirit gives you and uh, makes you as one part of the body. For instance, the Bible says a lot, Paul says a lot about the church as a body. Your foot, a hand. You know, all these different things. What if your eye says, I don't want to be an eye anymore. I want to be a hand. That'd be really awkward, you know, having a hand where your eye used to be. Uh, but all these things, it's for the use into the service of the King of Kings and Lord Lord in the body of Christ. So once again, we see that as an, a Jewish thing. So, and then fourth and final is that believer's baptism. Notice when in Matthew chapter 28, many of us can quote this verse, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, that's known as, verse number 18, where to start, Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18, it says, and Jesus spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore... And teach all nations. It means discipleship making. Make disciples of all nations. Notice why. Or notice what happens after that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So each way, the Jewish thought about baptism, it's in the New Testament. It's amazing. So, okay. You have one use of from unclean to clean. Now, next use is that of death to life. The next use is that of sanctifying for the use in the temple. The next use is that of being under 
somebody's teaching, being a disciple of a specific person. Now, for us as believers in the New Testament, what the baptism is, is that we're baptized not in the name of any human name, but rather the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are disciples of God Himself. Amazing. Now, you might say, wow, that is all so fascinating. Get to the point. (laughs) What about Jesus and His baptism? The question always comes to me and says, why did Jesus need to be baptized? That's a good question. To understand that question, you have to understand more and more what John's baptism was. It's not the same as believer's baptism. John's baptism is getting everybody ready for the coming Messiah. And here's what happens in Matthew chapter number 3. Turn back there with me. And we're going to see Jesus Christ baptized. Why did He get baptized? Four reasons. There are four reasons. And the last one is the the crucial thing about baptism for us as well. Notice with me of four reasons. It, number one, identifies Jesus with sinners. Over and over again, we see that Jesus identifies Himself to be the friend of sinners. You think about the different people that He hung out with. The social outcasts. The people that the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, they didn't want anything to do with. I think that of Matthew. Matthew gets called, he's a tax collector. One of the most hated people among the people of Israel is a tax collector. Because not only do you take money for Rome, you're, 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 you're being paid off by Rome in order to get the money of Israel, now you sometimes add more to the tax and put it in your own pocket. So they're seen as a terrible person. These sinners, these publicans, they're not republicans, they're they're publicans. Um, (laughs) uh, Interesting enough. uh, And so Matthew gets called. Come and follow me. He comes. He throws a big party with all of his friends, which are publicans and other people that are the outcasts. And Jesus is eating with them. Unheard of in those days. He is... The friend of the sinner. And then you see the the Pharisees always question it. Why does your master eat with sinners, eat with publicans, if he was the Messiah? Well, he says, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. Uh, A person that is unwell, a person that is well doesn't need a doctor, but a person that is unwell needs a physician. And he said, I have come to seek those who are repentant. Seek the lost people, the sinners, to repentance. Amazing. He identifies with sinners. Number number two, not only that, but he identifies with the message that John is proclaiming about the kingdom. Notice with me in in chapter 4, verse number 17 of Matthew, what happens after he was baptized, after the temptation in the wilderness, this is what happens. Verse 17 of chapter 4, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is the king to usher in the kingdom. He is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. He is the one that will eventually correct every wrong that has ever been done on the place on the face of the earth, and put in His own kingdom, and He's going to rule and reign there for a thousand years. And then forever afterwards. Okay. That is who Jesus Christ is. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is identifying with the message of John. Exact same message that John gave. But not only does he identify with sinners, not only does he identify with the message of John according to the kingdom, it identifies Jesus as the Messiah to John. For an interesting look at John chapter number 1, it's interesting. John says that I did not know that Jesus was the Messiah until after he was baptized. Amazing. He says, I did not know the The one who sent me into the world said the one that the Spirit comes down as a dove to 
after you baptize, that is the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he said, I did not know until that moment. It identifies John, Jesus, to John. Now, John might have had some idea about it because what he says to Jesus, when Jesus comes to get baptized, he says, I, uh, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? He's saying there, Jesus has a perfect life. Everything that he does is right. John has never seen Jesus ever do wrong, and they're cousins. Think about it. If you see a cousin never doing any wrong, you think, well, this person's a lot better than I am. But yet, he wasn't for sure until Jesus was baptized. But, you might say, these are all good reasons, but how does it apply to me? The last reason is the thing that I'm going to get. So if, if your neighbor is sleeping, just uh, nudge him. <laughs> this is what it is. It's because Jesus was obedient to the Father's will. That is the reason why he was baptized. Because God, the Father, wanted him to be baptized. He says in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, that's John, Suffereth, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. God the Father wanted God the Son to be baptized, and God the Son obeyed. For us, how obedient are we to God the Father? That is the crucial thing. And so Jesus was baptized, and we have an amazing show forth of the Trinity. The dove came down, the Holy Spirit as a dove came down on Jesus and it powered Him. And the Father gave a seal of approval. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus' baptism is all about obedience for us. Are we obedient to the call that God has for us? Some here, or even through the internet as I'm recording this, some might be saying, well, I've never been baptized. Well, God says in His Word, for believers to be baptized. You might say, well, then I would have to get baptized. I was baptized as an infant. Should I get rebaptized? And I said, well, I got rebaptized. You know, I am the very definition of Anabaptist because I got baptized again. For those who weren't here, it's interesting. So I was baptized on De December 13th, 1998. And it's interesting, the next day, I got saved. And now, looking back at it, I, that was the point in time I'm like, well, that is my conversion, but the day before was my baptism, so do I still need to get baptized because I got saved the day after? And I did my research. I looked up the Bible. I'm like, well, believers get baptized after they get saved. And the Lord really spoke to my heart, really pressed upon me. You need to get baptized. So, I went to Pastor Lapino at the time. And I said, Pastor, I got a problem. I need to get baptized. <laughs> He's like, well, you're already a member of the church. Well, let's go ahead and get that officiated then. And so along with other uh, young people at that time, we had a lot of different teenagers or whatever, along with them came out me and I got baptized by Pastor Lupino. So yes, I'm the very definition of Anabaptist. Baptized again. So... Yes, I would say if you are feeling led to gain baptized, even if you were uh, sprinkled as a child, yeah, we, can, we can make that happen. Now, some of you might be saying, where is your baptistry if you are indeed a Baptist church? Good question. It's right underneath me. I'm right here underneath all these chairs. We have to move all the chairs and prop up the baptistry and then fill it with water and then we could actually do it. So just, just FYI for those who did not know about our church, that's where it is. But the thing about it is it goes beyond being baptized. It's obedience. What has God asked or told us to do? And are we obedient? Are we humble enough to say yes to Him? That is the question 
that I want to leave with you. So I'll invite James to come to the piano. He's going to play uh, a hymn, kind of go through a hymn. We're going to pray. And if the Lord has really shown you that there's an area in your life that you need to be obedient to, towards, I want you to pray, not my will, but thine be done. And then after that, we'll have one more thing that we have to do, and then we'll close our service out. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for each one here. Do your work now in our hearts. I do pray in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this time where we can just speak to you freely. Father, we ask you to help us, help our hearts to be humble enough to say, not my will, but yours be done. Do whatever you want in our, in our lives. May we truly look to you. May we truly obey your call. And Father, we ask you to be with each person here. And Father, may you help us to become more like Christ more obedient to Your will, Father. And I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.